or an approach concept to commercial uh, domestic water heating design. Um, you know, we'll, we need to cover a few things when it comes to efficiencies, just to kind of have a good background of um, you know why we take a certain approach, um, and it's really kind of um, going to be targeting uh, recovery versus storage. And with recovery, um, we're kind of equating that to like instantaneous, right? So whether it's a a wall hung boiler um, or like a you know a, a true domestic water heating boiler. Um, so that's more of an instantaneous type uh, piece of equipment, um, and you know we'll kind of be comparing um, that uh, or integrating that into the design and how that can change when we utilize some storage um, at the same time. So. Um, so to kick it off, uh, basically one of the reasons why everyone kind of looks at instantaneous is um, there is a concept that they are more efficient. Well, so this is basically ANSI Z21.10.3's um, you know, efficiency um, calculation, right? So it's pretty simple. Uh, basically what they're doing is they're taking uh, the amount of BTUs that are generated um, to create hot water, and they divide that by the amount of BTUs of natural gas and any uh, um, electricity or any other inputs uh, that go into making that hot water, and that basically gives you your thermal efficiency. Um, so it's a 30-minute test, and the inlet, um, the water inlet is 70 degrees. Um, and the outlet is 140. So that delta T across this test is 70 degrees. Um, now, kind of industry standard, and we'll go through the physics why, uh, but usually anything above 84% um, is considered condensing, and anything below 84% is non-condensing. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll definitely touch on that too. So, um, so as we said, the Z21.10.3 is the efficiency test standard that everything um, from a, a piece of equipment has to adhere to, and that's how it's judged. So um, there are some myths uh, that we like to say myths, uh, but basically that test efficiency is equal to operational efficiency, um, basically saying that um, the test is geared towards a piece of equipment. It's not geared towards a system. Um, so we're going to kind of go over why that is really important. And then because of that, um, you know, there's a concept that instantaneous uh, is more efficient um, than a storage type water heater. So we'll also touch base on that. Um, there's a bunch of different factors that influence that efficiency test, right? So um, the fuel, what type of burner, um, you know, your quality of burn, uh, which is a mixture of combustion air and emissions, and then also your return water temperature. Um, and your piping design. Um, so the main factor that has some of the most influence on this is your return water temperature. Um, and the reason why is because the higher the temperature of water that we're feeding this, the less BTUs we can cram into the water to hit the one, you know, to get that temperature target of 140. So if you look at the efficiency chart here, this is kind of an easy breakdown. Um, of, you know, you have on your um, x-axis is your boiler efficiency, your y-axis is your return water temperature. That's what we're feeding it, right? So the higher the return water temperature, the lower the efficiency. And it's because of that basic physics concept of I have to cram BTUs in the water. The more BTUs I can cram into the water, the more efficient it is. Um, and that test standard is done right there on that graph, which is the 70 degree mark. Um, so that's why when you have all of these um, efficiency ratings, um, you know, most of them are going to be like in the mid 90s, let's say, um, because it is at that 70 degree return temperature. Um, now, when it comes to any tankless or instantaneous type setup, this is how that system or that efficiency was derived. Um, you know, you have 70 degrees coming in, you have your gas supply, and then you have your hot water outlet. 70 degrees delta T, and they let it run for 30 minutes. So, um, and if, if we can please mute, mute phones at all possible, it would be greatly appreciated. Um, and then, so the colder water temperatures 
also equal less recovery, right? So if we're returning below 70 degrees in an instantaneous, we are going to be, have, we will have less recovery in an instantaneous type um, appliance than if we're returning 70 degrees or above, okay? So in a commercial type setting, um, we're gonna have to have research systems, right? Um, so this is a really simplistic way that you would look at a true instantaneous commercial system. Um, you have your incoming water, um, you know, your cold water, uh, you have your hot water outlet, you have your research going out into the system, there's your loop, there's your fixtures, um, and then we bring it back and we tie it into the cold water feed to the appliance. So what we're doing basically though is we're preheating the cold water feed, right? So we're changing the equation of that original test procedure of 70 degrees on the incoming, okay? Um, so we need to take that into consideration when we start talking about efficiencies. Um, so in order to, for most instantaneous type um, appliances, um, when it comes to um, a commercial type design, they wanna minimize the amount of short cycling that that appliance sees. So if there's a minimal amount of flow going into the system, we also have a return loop coming back. You know, these things fire on flow. So if they see flow, they know they need to fire. So in order to mitigate that short cycling, um, they install storage, okay? And this is a simplistic, you know, very common type design of the way that, um, you know, a tankless water heater with storage uh, would be implemented into your design. Um, you still have your loop with your return, but we're pulling out of the hot water storage tank. From there, we have another pump that's bringing it back into the tankless water heater that's feeding it through the hot water supply into the storage tank. So, but at the same time, we're still mixing that water going into the tankless water heater. This is also true with boilers, not just tankless water heaters. It's the same standard. Um, so that appliance is set to whatever efficiency rating they give it. It's the same ANSI Z21.10.3 test. Um, so that the test conditions are really difficult and basically impossible to duplicate in a real life scenario. And here's why. So um, as we said, that boiler's tested to that ANSI efficiency. Um, but when it comes to how we operate in a domestic water system where we have much more fluctuating demands. We have certain scenarios where we have really high demand. We have um, the majority of the time we're at really low demand, um, depending on the type of building and the type of usage profile that we're gonna associate with that building. Well, if you look at this simple, um, you know, secondary piping type scenario, uh, we have our instantaneous heater or boiler and there's our storage tank, there's our cold water feed coming in, we're tying it into um, the return uh, interconnected piping to the storage tank. So what this means is basically, um, you know, we're flowing water constantly across that heat exchanger um, in order to one, protect the heat exchanger because every instantaneous is gonna have a minimal supply or a minimal um, amount of mass inside that heat exchanger, and that's how we heat that water so quickly. If we had a lot of mass inside of that heat exchanger, obviously it wouldn't be instantaneous because there's no way we can put that many BTUs into that um, amount of water and still be instantaneous. So in order to um, heat the water that quickly, we have a minimal amount of water inside that heat exchanger. Well, what that also means is we need to protect that heat exchanger because under low flow conditions, um, you know, we're heating that water so quickly that if we don't evacuate that water out, we're gonna be burning out our heat exchangers. So that's why heat exchangers on an instantaneous will have a minimum flow requirement. Um, that's also why the sizing of the pump for that secondary piping um, is so important. Um, so for instance, let's say that that heat exchangers uh, minimum flow is 15 GPM. Um, so that means that pump's pushing 15 GPM, it's pulling it from the tank, um, pushing it through the, um, the instantaneous 
or uh, condensing boiler, and then throwing it right back into the tank. It's always moving 15 GPM. That's, that's what it's doing. Um, it's running constantly. Now, if there's a call for demand inside that building um, that's less than 15 GPM, like let's say there's only 3 GPM, let's say someone turns on a mop sink or something, um, and that's the only usage inside that building. Um, so it's only 3 GPM inside the building. We're pulling that out of the tank. We're only feeding 3 GPM from the cold water supply to make up that water that we're using out in that building. Well, the other 12 GPM has got to come from somewhere. And where that's coming from is the storage tank where we're storing 140 degree water. So we're only mixing three degrees of cold water with, or I'm sorry, we're only mixing three GPM of cold water with 12 GPM of hot water. Obviously, we're not feeding that unit the coldest water as possible in order to maintain the efficiencies that that the piece of equipment was actually certified to. So because of that type of scenario, any boiler tank or instantaneous type heater with a storage tank is going to have more of a, an efficiency curve that looks like this. So under low demands, which, and this is just, you know, an example, um, but under low, exam, uh, low demands, so your y-axis is your GPM, your x is going to be your appliance efficiencies. Under low demands, you're actually below easily 90 degrees, or 90 um, uh, percent. So as the flow or demand in that building increases, now we're introducing more cold water into that heat exchanger, and that is what drives the efficiency of that appliance. So that's why the efficiency curves on instantaneous units look like this. Um, so, and because of that, most of the time, depending on the building, you're really not operating at higher flow demands. Uh, the majority of the time, whether it's a school, um, you know, let's say even um, an office building or um, a, yeah, a hotel, uh, you're, you're operating at a, the lower range of the GPM demand. Um, so you're actually operating at the lower end of the efficiency curve. Now, some of the other things that aren't taken into consideration with that efficiency certification is standby loss, the pump, um, you know, like I said before, the, differenti or the, the, um, the different demands in the system, and all of that takes energy. And we're only certifying the piece of equipment that's gray, right? We're not certifying the system, um, like we said before. So that piece of equipment might be certified at 96%, but again, that's to the ANSI Z21.10.3 standard. Um, once we get into the system, all of these other factors factor into the total cost of operation for that owner, and that drops the system efficiency usually by at least 4%. Um, so that's your pump, that's your standby loss from your tank. Uh, that's also the additional standby loss from the secondary piping that's going from the storage tank back to the um, appliance. So that's your true operational um, efficiency is usually right about in there. So when we come to secondary piping, um, this is a very typical type piping scenario. Um, and this is also where some of the standby losses can be, um, you know, hit. Um, so, but we have to ensure that we have that proper flow rate and velocity going through those heat exchangers in, in order to protect them. And that's why the secondary piping is so necessary and why those pumps and the sizes of the pumps that are installed in that system are so necessary as well. Um, so from a simplistic point of view, and this is where we're going to start getting into sizing, but I also want to kind of show this. From a simplistic point of view, um, a water heater goes through the same testing standards for certification. The difference is, is it's a system. We have the stored water inside that same appliance that's judged to that efficiency. We're not changing anything when it comes to the actual system when it's used 
um, with regard to the true efficiencies of what the owner is going to see inside their facility. Um, you'll also notice a few other things when it comes to this type of uh, piping diagram. You look at where the recirc, the building recirculation loop is coming back in. Um, we're not tying it into the cold water feed to the heaters. We're actually tying it into the mid body of the storage tank. And that's extremely important when it comes to the operational efficiencies that we're saying that those units achieve. Um, and so, like we said before, the return water temperature is the most important factor to the judging of the efficiency of that appliance, okay? So if you look at that mid-body return fitting on the bottom right with that red arrow next to it, we're bringing back that building return, which is at a higher temperature than obviously the cold that we're feeding it. We're bringing it back into a non-condensing zone of that condensing water heater. The reason why we do that is, is in those situations where that building might only see 3 GPM, right, we're not preheating that 3 GPM feeding that heater. We're going to pull out of that heater, but the only water that we're actually feeding that water heater is as cold as possible, which means that our efficiency curves are much flatter. So if we say we're 96% or 97%, it's a true 96, 97% regardless of how much flow that building is seeing. Um, so that's really important when you're talking to your customers and your owners and having that conversation with them saying, hey, you know, if you really want to achieve that true efficiency and save that cost, this is a very important factor that needs to be taken into consideration. Um, so again, this kind of shows the different zones. Yes, any storage heater, you're going to have some stratification inside that tank. Um, well, if we're utilizing that mid-body return fitting, we want it to stratify. We want cold water to be on the bottom of that tank so we can achieve the efficiencies that we're actually advertising. Um, so that's why an upper tank circula um, circulator is relatively important uh, because it kind of makes that tank stratify in zones. Um, so we're not actually turning that tank completely over from top to bottom. We want it to stratify. We want that condensing zone, zone to be cold so that when we heat it up from the top down and that water is flowing from bottom up, we squeeze every bit of BTUs into that water as possible. So what we're going to talk about now is what we call dynamic water heating. It's taking that concept of designing around an instantaneous but coupling it with storage. And by instantaneous, that's basically recovery, right? So if you design a building and you come up with your top line target of what your top line GPM may be, let's say it's 100 GPM, um, if you're designing it for an instantaneous um, system, you have to design it for 100 GPM. Regardless if you have, you know, if they've coupled any storage in it or not, um, you, you have to sit there and say that those pieces of equipment have to provide 100 GPM. Um, and if that's the case, you're also designing that system for 100% of um, combustion air requirements, 100% of venting, 100% of fuel. Um, so that's a, that's, it's not just the, um, piece of equipment that you have to design to that, it's all the ancillary um, factors that go into supporting those pieces of equipment. So as we look at water heating design, we're kind of going to go through a little romp through history. Um, a lot of systems are still designed um, around the concept from like 2000, right? Um, if you're using Hunter's Curve, uh, like the standard Hunter's Curve, this is basically what you're designing to. Um, now, if you're using modified Hunter's Curve, yeah, it does take some things into consideration. Um, so back in the day, amazingly, 21 years ago, um, you know, the average shower was anywhere from 3 to 5 GPM, right? So that's what you would kind of say that that room is going to be requiring. Um, the redundancy factor was a little bit less. Um, efficiencies were still like in the mid-80s. We're, we're, we there wasn't some proliferation of... Um, high efficient condensing pieces of equipment. Um, and because of that, they also had lower set points. A lot of the buildings were set at 120, 
um, you know, for scald reasons, and that's what they sent out. Um, and there was also, especially when it comes to facilities like um, hotels and um, medical or hospitals or assisted living, they would have centralized systems inside of there to support that facility, which would also be like food service, laundry, which would, be would have to be taken into consideration um, with the domestic water heating uh, design. Um, so as we move forward, you know, 20 years later, 21 years later, uh, there's a lot of factors that have changed. Um, we use water differently. Rooms and showers are now almost exclusively low flow. Um, you know, at most you're going to see out of a shower now is 2 to 2.5. A lot of them are a lot less than that. Uh, the redundancy factors that we go by has now changed. Now we're in plus one. So if we, use, if we lose a unit, we're still operating on 100%. Right? That's what that N plus one basically means. Um, all of our pieces of equipment is kind of industry standard now where you're going with condensing, um, you know, for multiple reasons. Um, and then we're jacking up the temperature, um, especially in a medical type of um, design. Um, we're not sending, you know, 120 degrees um, out into the system. We're almost always sending above that, 140 at least. Um, and then they've you know, outsourced a lot of those centralized um, systems uh, that used to be in those facilities, like your laundry, like your food service, you know. They're, they're utilizing um, other companies and actually subcontracting that out, ship, shipping it out and then bringing it back in so that those are not always um, in our designs anymore. Um, so the common overview, you know, of exactly what we just said. Um, but at the same time, every time you heat up water, um, you're adding more mass. We're putting more BTUs into each gallon of water uh, that we produce. Um, and so basically what we're trying to convey is, is we can take a different approach when it comes to domestic water heating design. Um, you know, we, we can look at buildings and how they use water differently. Um, we can kind of look inside um, of the tanks um, and the water heaters uh, that we are um, specifying and say, well, how much water do we actually have inside that tank? Remember, we're trying to get these tanks to stratify. So if we have, let's say, 200 gallons of, uh, inside of a water heater, well, we really don't have 200 gallons of 140-degree water. You know, we have uh, much cooler water on, on the bottom of that tank. Um, so we also need to take that into consideration. Um, and then also, obviously, low flow. You know, I mean, this is just a basic slide of showing what the difference is. I mean, this is just saying dishwashers. You know, back in the day, you know, we're, we were using 10 to 15 gallons per load. Now we're using half that, if not a third of that. Um, and so we don't need to design to that 10 to 15 gallons per load anymore. Um, we should be taking that into consideration. Um, and Every building's different. A restaurant is going to use water completely different than an elementary school, right? Um, and this is basically what Hunter's Curve was. Um, Hunter's Curve was basically derived decades ago. It's been updated a few times, um, but in the last 20 years, we've seen a huge shift um, in the pace of um, the variables that need to be taken into consideration when designing a domestic hot water system for a commercial application. Um, so like we said, flow rates have declined. Um, you know, we got to keep water moving, so that recirc loop is imperative. Um, you know, there's a lot more liability out there with infectious diseases, and because of that, sanitizing that water um, is, is very important. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of people that are very sue happy if something goes wrong, which is exposing a lot of the designers and um, building owners, you know, to that type of um, liability. Um, so, you know, because of that, you know, there's things that were derived, like, you know, 188P. That's um, that's something that we all need to take into consideration. Well, with that higher elevated temperature, this is where the sanitization comes into, into view. Um, you know, 
If we're heating water up to 140, you still have to take into account a kill time. And this is another thing that we need to factor into with regards to instantaneous units. That instantaneous unit might be flowing, you know, whatever it is, up to, up to 140 degrees, but you're not killing it unless you have contact time with, for 32 minutes, okay? So if we're flowing a good amount of water through a system, you're creating 140 degree water, throwing it out into the system, and then blending it right back down to 120 as it goes to the fixtures for scald protection. Well, at 120, Legionella can survive. So unless you're actually killing it with contact time that's greater than 32 minutes, you're just passing along that Legionella down the system and then dropping back down the temperature to where it can actually still reproduce and survive. Um, now there's other factors that go into that. Obviously you have contact time with chlorine. Um, you know, you have moving water. So all of that's taken into consideration. But what we're saying is, is the higher temperature you can sit there and create, the quicker the kill time is to kill Legionella. So once we start getting above like 158, it's basically an instantaneous kill time, okay? So we don't have to sit there and worry about, you know, that contact time um, with regards to temperature. Um, we can sit there and just kind of cruise through it. So what is dynamic water heating design? Well, what we're doing is we want to make sure that demand is taken care of 100% of the time. We're taking into consideration the maximum flow rate but also building diversity in how that building uses water. Um, that can change, right, throughout the hour. Um, but at the same time, too, we want to make sure we don't have too big of a tank um, to where we're not turning that water over. So tank turnover, especially from a medical design standpoint, is very important. We want to make sure that we don't have stagnant water. We need to turn that tank over multiple times an hour. Um, obviously, efficiencies matter. That's what the owner's paying to make that system run. Um, and then, you know, we have redundancy factors and everything else that we want to take into consideration. So here's a quick snapshot of Hunter's Curve, right? So restaurant curve, top left, on the bottom, right, elementary and high schools, they obviously use water differently. So when it comes to dynamic water heating design, we're taking into consideration that we're not operating 100%, 100% of the time. At those times where we're not operating at 100%, we can utilize our recovery to make up the available hot water that we can use inside that building, okay? So on the bottom left, you kind of have your diversity chart. So what that is is there's four columns. You know, your column on the left where, like, for restaurant it's eight, uh, for hospital it's five. That's basically the amount of minutes in a 15-minute or quarter-hour period that you're expecting that building to run at 100%, which is eight minutes for a restaurant, 50%, which is five minutes for a restaurant, 25%, which is two minutes for a restaurant, and 10% of that demand, which is 0% for a restaurant. Now that's gonna be drastically different than a K through 12 school, which is going on the bottom, right? Um, that 100% load for a high school might only be three minutes out of a 15 minute segment. Um, you know, and so it, it's a much flatter curve. Here's a kind of a graphical shot of the, exactly what we were talking about with GPMs involved, right? So right here we're looking at, you know, of the top chart, 26 GPM for a restaurant. Well, we are expecting 26 GPM to be required 100% of the time for eight minutes out of that quarter hour segment, okay? Now, once those, that demand diversity drops down, our GPM drops down. So we can utilize that downtime in GPM demand to build back up our recovery and store it with our recovery and build back up our available hot water inside of our tank um, so that we're, we don't have to size for that 26 GPM, you know? It, 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 it's much more um, dynamic. So 
I'm going to actually run through a few examples, um, but this is basically just kind of a quick, this is a simple one that was done that and we'll go through this so it makes more sense. But um, to hit, let's say, you know, 50 GPM, that instantaneous BTU requirement, requirements might be above 3.7 million BTUs. Where if we utilize that downtime and that demand with recovery and storage that we have available, we can downsize that system to be just above 2.8. Um, we're still turning the tanks over, the building's still getting the hot water they need, but we reduce the system supply and venting requirements by almost a third. That's huge when it comes to um, building a building. Um, you know, obviously you gotta get under budget, uh, but that's also true because install cost, not only of the equipment, but the venting, the gas, the footprint, everything else. So if you're looking at this and, you know, from, from how a system will use um, hot water, basically what the blue line is representing is the available amount of hot water we have to distribute inside that building. The red line is representing the demand inside that building. You'll notice how they're inversely correlated. So as the demand goes up, the available tank volume goes down. As the demand goes down, because of recovery, our available tank volume goes up. So when we look at the building operating through its true system design, um, this is more um, realistic in how that building is using water and how the pieces of equipment that we've specified into that design um, are providing that hot water. So this is over a two hour period. Um, that's why you're gonna have eight cycles of demand. Um, so, you know, and it has it broken down by minutes. Um, so, I mean, this is an average, right? So there's sometimes in that system where, you know, you might have 100% in the middle of that 15 minute segment or at the end of that 15 minute segment, but basically this is taking an average for that building and how it's using water. So, the other thing it takes into consideration is tank stratification. Um, so, obviously, you know, the less the tank is stratified, the greatest amount of hot water is available. The least amount, the minimal amount of hot water is available. So, as we use water, so you might be sitting there at some times where you have the tank on the right, um, where you have a bunch of hot water available. But as demand goes up, you're going to shift over to more of like a tank on the left, right? So you know, your usable, your usable volume goes down. But what we're saying is, is that that's not gonna be true 100% of the time. So I'm gonna skip through this because we've talked about it. I mean, this is basic, you know, this is exactly what we've been talking about. But we're kind of gonna get into a few options when it comes to tools. And this is true across any manufacturer that has water heaters. Um, it's physics. It's not like certain manufacturers have patents on physics and the laws of physics. So, I mean, you can correlate this to any manufacturer out there. Um, so in this scenario, like, you know, looking at a hospital, that hunter's curve profile is different, like we said before. It'd be different if it was a military barracks or a hotel, a large hotel versus a small hotel. If it was a convention hotel, it's going to use it completely different than just a, you know, a stay and play hotel on the side of the highway. So on this one, we're picking a, um, an assisted living or a hospital type profile. You can pop in your, um, your fixture unit counts. Um, it's totally, you know, up to that individual design. It takes all of that into consideration when it comes up to the flow demand. So in this situation, you know, it's saying that we would be able to satisfy this system with two 1.3 million BTUs, but both with 500 gallons of storage. So we have 2.6 million BTUs and 500 gallons of storage, in, or I'm sorry, 1,000 gallons of storage for that facility, right? Well, that's pretty conservative. I mean, that's a ton of water. We're only turning that water heater over three times an hour. If you're looking at in the bottom right, above the dynamic BTU range, you're gonna have your water heater turnover. That's how many times we're actually turning those tanks over for that system, okay? 
That's very important for a hospital. We want to maximize that. Um, if you look at the bottom center, you're going to see the instantaneous BTU requirements in order to hit the, um, the top flow range of the sizing and how it was achieved. Okay, so that's what would be required if you want a pure instantaneous type system. With this selection, like we said, we're at 2.6. We have two 1.3 million BTUs, 500 gallons apiece. So with this selection, it'd be 2.6 million BTUs. Right there, we've downsized it by, you know, 76%. Um, that's huge, right? That's a big difference. But that's still not exactly the way I want that building profile to work. So we can change that. So now instead of two 1.6 million BTUs, let's go with two or three 1 million BTUs with 130 gallons. Now we've changed that water heater turnover, that how many times we're turning over that tank to eight times an hour. We're moving, right? I mean, we're turning that water over. It's not stagnant. We are definitely moving water. Um, you know, we've increased our dynamic demand BTUs. Now we're closer to the three million, right? Um, you know, but we're still about, you know, a little bit more than 50% differential between an instantaneous. So we're still saving a ton of money. Um, so this is kind of the extreme on the other side, right? Um, you know, we're turning the tanks over a lot. Um, our redundancy factor maybe isn't exactly what I want. If I lose a unit, we're only operating at 75%, okay? So let's downsize the BTUs again, um, but we're increasing the heater. So now, you know, our usable storage of water has um, gone up a little bit. We're not turning the tanks over as much. We're still turning them over six times an hour. We've upped our recovery a little bit, but we're still going from 4.6 million BTUs down to 3.2 and still satisfying that system, okay? Um, so approaching water heating this way can really utilize a lot of the factors that your customer might be looking for. Um, you know, there's your N minus one, right? So if we lose a unit, we're at 90%. Um, you can factor that into your, your design, you know? Let's say you want to go with a true, you know, N plus one design. Well, maybe we sit there and say, I can go with five heaters and go with, you know, 600,000 BTUs instead of three eighths or four eighths, right? Um, you can kind of play with it and I'll tell you exactly what you're gonna have in that system. The other part of it is you can sit there and it gives you all of your inputs, all your outputs, your performance. If the building owner wants to know how their profile is gonna work throughout that two hour period, you can kind of let them know. Is it gospel? No, but it's a really good snapshot of what that building will actually be using instead of designing around the top end 100%. So with that, um, I'm actually going to um, go through a quick, yeah, uh, actually go to, yes, that one. Okay. So like we said before, you know, if you sat there and designed it for, let's say, an apartment or a condo, um, and let's say it was designed around, you know, an instantaneous system, right? So let's say you design that system for 100 GPM, right? It doesn't matter, right? So right now we designed that system. It's going to be requiring, you know, basically, like we said, the amount of GPM that's there. What we can do is we can go in and start playing with it and get it to where we can start using it, right? So in this situation, you know, the instantaneous load is above 5 million BTUs. Well, we can get away with 2 million, still satisfy that building. We're turning over the water heaters four and a half times an hour, right? Um, if we lose a unit, we're at 75%. Let's say we don't like that profile. I want to sit there and see what we can do with maybe a, a higher redundancy factor. Okay, so let's drop that down to four. Let's kick that up to five. Now we're at 70% or 80%, sorry, instead of 75. Um, you know, 
let's say you want to get underneath the boiler code requirement where you're kind of racking them up, right? It's going to take 10 of them suckers to do it, but you're also looking down here. We're only turning over 2.3 times an hour, okay? But we have 1,000 gallons of storage in that system. So, you know, we're, that, that's how we're able to achieve that. Now, we have 1,000 gallons of storage, but we only have 700 available because of stratification, okay? Now, if you look down here, you're going to see that you can kind of look at exactly what it is. So we put 100 GPM into our equation, right? And this is where you're looking at step downs. So here's your 100 GPM. So for two minutes, at three minutes, so basically we're saying for um, our condo, it's only going to need 100% load for two minutes out of every quarter hour period. Right? So for eight minutes out of an hour, we're only going to need that 100% load. So if we designed it around that, that's where we're going to get into that 5.1 million BTU scenario. But because we know our building's not going to use that, you know, for one, two, three. So for three minutes, we'll be used at 50% capacity, which is going to be your 50 GPM. And then it steps down again. Then it steps down again. And then we'll sit there and just kind of keep um, recycling that scenario as an average across two hours, okay? So this is a great tool that you guys can use. And again, this is not proprietary to anyone. This is physics, right? This is something that you can use um, for really anybody. Um, if it's a water heater with a storage tank or even recovery with storage, this is a basic scenario that you can use all the time. Okay. So once you sit there and pick what your, you know, we got a huge redundancy factor here. Um, you know, if we lose something, we're still operating really pretty well for that building. We're still turning over four and a half times an hour. We're still saving a good amount of money on um, the requirements for um, everything feeding the appliance. Let's say that's what we want to choose. So once that's done, you know, you can kind of pick through. It'll give you certain scenarios. The other thing, too, that is kind of nice, you can play with stored temperature. So let's say you want to go with an instantaneous kill at 160 degrees, right? That's going to change everything, right? One, the instantaneous requirement is going to drastically go up. You'll notice ours didn't, right? Ours didn't go up nearly as much percentage-wise as the instantaneous, um, which is always true because theirs is being judged on that delta T. Um, which is, um, you know, if they're coming in at a certain temperature, for them to raise that up an additional 20 degrees takes a lot more BTUs. So, um, you know, th that's also something that's, you know, kind of nice about this is that it changes that variable um, as you do it. Um, let's say your incoming water temperature is different. Let's say you're designing something down in Atlanta, right? Well, for the, to hit this, your instantaneous dropped, right? Our difference capacity dropped. Um, let's say you want to go with a different efficiency and say, I want to operate at 95. All of this stuff is just math. So you can change it as you want to see fit. So once that's done, you can always create a report. Um, basically what it is, is it's something that you can save to a PDF and equate to whatever you want. Um, you know, once that's done, it gives you a nice kind of snapshot of exactly what you can use inside that building. You can use it for your records. It takes into account. If we did fixture counts, it would have it in here as well. Um, but this isn't just applicable for natural gas heating and condensing type units. Like we said before, it's physics. It's recovery versus storage. So because of that, you can also use it for, let's say, steam, right? You know, so like let's say we go into a scenario where you can put in your fixture counts and it'll automatically do it, um, but peak demand by industry, right? So there's our eight minutes at 100%, 550 to that, and then basically zero for restaurant. That doesn't change whether you're using, this is steam, but it wouldn't change if you're using boiler water, steam, or natural gas. That demand doesn't change. So let's say that we come up with a scenario where we want to use, we same thing, let's say 100 GPM. Um, and our inlet, let's say, is 40. 
um, we go back to our peak and let's do the same thing where it was an apartment or condo. So we have five, four, four, two, right? So that's how much we're using in that system. Four, four, two. All right, so there's our building profile, right? Come up with about the exact same amount of BTUs in that system, about five million, a little bit over five million. So for steam, obviously, if we have this selection, we're not going to last long. This is our available. This is our demand. Whoop, we lost it, right? So it's the same thing. We're just playing around with recovery and storage. If we want to sit there and say, hey, I got a heat exchanger, a steam to water heat exchanger that's going to produce 30 GPM, um, you know, let's say you want to change your steam pressure. You can. Obviously, the higher the steam pressure, the more recovery you're going to get. It's going to change things. Um, let's say you go with two heat exchangers at 30. Well, it's a little bit better of a curve, but not great, right? Um, let's say you want to do uh, two tanks instead of one. All right, that'll do it. We can sit there and I'll utilize it, but man, we're not looking great during some periods of time. We never bottom out on our available tank volume, but I'm kind of not exactly thrilled um, with that type of, um, you know, available tank usage into that building demand. So let's say instead of that, we want to sit there and say, but I'm doing it, right? So let's say I want a 100% um, redundancy. Oh, not that much. All right. So that's very flat. But basically what I'm doing here is I have two units. Each unit will have two 30 GPM heat, ex heat exchangers on it. Each unit will have 150 gallons of storage, right? Well, we reduced the amount of steam piping and everything else by 45% if we were going to go with instantaneous. The pounds per hour required for this system is just under three. The pounds per hour for instantaneous is going to be almost 5.3. So your steam piping is drastically reduced. Um, the amount of steam capacity that's going to be required in order to achieve these flow rates from your power plant is going to be drastically reduced. Um, and you have a completely flat curve, which basically means if we lose a unit and we go down from, you know, four and we use a complete unit down to two on the heat exchangers, we're still good, but, you know, we're limping along, right? So you can factor all of that stuff into your design, um, you know, and I just want to make sure that everyone kind of takes that into consideration when they're designing some of their um, facility. So um, with that, I'll open it up for questions. Um, absolutely, un, you know, unmute your phone and ask away. Um, so yeah, we got one question from Dave. Um, in the boiler tank arrangement, what type of temperature do you assume is going back to the boiler? It depends on the flow rate. Um, you know, and, and, and that's kind of the shooting in the dark part of what your efficiencies truly are um, because you don't really know. I mean, so if you're flowing more than what the, um, the heat exchanger flow requirement is, um, then, you know, we're kind of deadheading that pump and we're feeding it more cold water, so that's negligible. But if, if, if it's, you know, 5 GPM versus 15, um, I mean, I guess you could do a calculation based on this the uh, stored temperature inside the storage tank, um, you know, and, and maybe equate it, but it's going to be a lot more than the 70 degrees that the piece of, um, of equipment or appliance was originally certified to. Um, does that answer your question, Dave? Um, oh, hi, this is David. Um, I guess the, the I guess I understand what you're saying. I, I just that you know, like when you look at typical like a condo arrangement where you've got a you know big vertical hot water tank and you're going back and forth between the boilers. You know, the Delta T on most of those systems is usually designed around twenty, maybe twenty five. Sure. So it, it's assuming that the cold water and the recirc are going back to the tank, mixing, you're getting some stratified temperature in the tank. So that stratified temperature obviously is now. Let's say your, your tank temperature is designed to maintain 140. I mean, I don't know. Right, so the temperature on the bottom of the tank, like we were talking about before, is going to be cooler. 
Yeah. So maybe it's like 115, 120. So that's why I was, you know, that that's kind of like how I see it, but I don't like, I've never actually measured it. I have no idea how anyone really knows what that temperature is going back to the. To right. The so some, some manufacturers will have a uh, T stat on top and a T stat on bottom. Um, it depends on how much water you're flowing through the system. If it's completely stagnant, um, you know, I, you can see maybe a, yeah, like you said, the 15 to 20 degree differential across that, um, you know, especially if we're flowing water um, and pulling it into the tank constantly, basically. Um, but if that's true, if we're storing at 140, and like you said, we're pulling maybe at best 120 out of it, um, if you're feeding that boiler with 120 water, um, you know, you're still not even close to where the original efficiency calculation was derived from, which was 70 degrees. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah. But isn't that more realistic? I mean, it, like, I mean, how often is it really going to be 70 degrees? I guess that's what I'm trying to understand because I don't. Right. I mean, that's what no, I'm you're at. really right on the money. Um, and and then that's exactly where we're kind of. Um, that's what we're trying to put a microscope on. Is hey, how often is that unit going to see 70 degrees? really realistically very little mm -hmm. um, but that's the efficiency calculation that's what that ANSI Z21.10.3 is right. um, so all of them kind of go through that and that's how they're certified but when it comes to true operational efficiency it's going to be minimal where they actually achieve the efficiencies that they're certified to but that's but it, also the, that's also the difference between a water heater and a boiler Right. So, a water heater, all of that is taken into account. You know, Does a condensing uh, boiler still make sense if you're doing that with a tank? With a tank, and you're potentially only getting maybe 120 back into the condensing unit uh, to the boiler. Does that still make sense for? Like, it's a bit of a, it's kind of a borderline temperature for condensing. Sure. Well, and that's also why it's really important that the appliances you guys sort of or specify have um, temperature sensors on your venting, right? Um, with these things being condensing units, they're saying inside their installation guys that you can use PVC for venting, polypropylene, or stainless steel, right? So mm -hmm. we need to have that poly for the acidity that we created when we burn um, you know, natural gas. So when you burn natural gas, you create CO2 and water. Well, CO2 and water means it's going to be acidic, um, which is why we need to have those materials. Um, but the downside of using those materials, especially the polymers, is they melt. So that efficiency rating that ANSI Z21.10.3 adheres to, you know, the lower the flue temperature, the more efficient it is. If we're raising or lowering the efficiency, but raising the temperature going up the stack, which means we're not putting as many BTUs into the water, we need to make sure that we're below the threshold of the piping material that is installed on that project. So if that vent temperature gets above 140, you're melting PVC, right? If it gets above 190, you're melting CPVC. Um, if it gets above, let's say, like 200, which, I mean, obviously, you're not even close to condensing at that point. Um, you know, I mean, that's that would be a nightmare scenario. But if you get above like 220, 225, now you're melting polypropylene. Um, and that's where you can get into some, you know, carbon monoxide issues uh, with regards to that facility because efficiency basically directly correlates with vent temperature. And that's why it's so important um, from a safety standpoint as well to make sure that our appliances are operating as efficiently as possible when they utilize those other materials for venting. Did I go off on a tangent or did that kind of answer your question? <laughs> no, it's good. Thank you. Okay. Um, 
Are there any other questions? Um, you guys can shoot from the hip, doesn't matter. Um, ask me what my favorite color is, I really don't care. Um, so, well, if there's no questions, I really appreciate everyone jumping on board. Uh, we kept it below the one hour um, target, which I'm pretty happy about. Um, so if anyone has any questions, please let us know. Um, like we said, this is a very simplistic forward way of approaching water heating. Um, it's recovery and storage and usage in a building. So it's basic math, um, but it's, it's tools that we can utilize um, to maximize uh, value for the customers that we're ultimately doing this for. So um, if no one has any questions, uh, I want to say thank you for jumping on. Um, and I Good hope question. Is this uh, recorded so we can share it with others? It is, and it'll actually be on our YouTube channel uh, probably later today or tomorrow. Uh, just take a look at our YouTube channel for that. It should be coming soon. It'll also be on social media that you can see. Um, Great. Thank you. Yeah, also, if you want a copy of the PowerPoint, uh, just let me know. I'll send it to you as well. No big deal. Um, but yeah, so thanks everybody for jumping on. Thanks, Brett. Uh, join us next time. It's April 21st. We'll be doing booster and fire pumps. That would be another very good class, I believe. Uh, again, it's going to be an ASPE CEU class as well. So, yeah. If you got any questions that pop up after this, feel free to give us a shout or shoot us an email. We'll take care of you that way as well. Sounds right, good. Thanks, thanks guys. Everyone. See you Have all. a great day.